Hello, I'm Stephen Wilson and I'm in my studio here in North London. And uh, my studio these days is um, equipped for Atmos mixing, surround mixing, which is what I do a lot of these days. Particularly mixing classic albums into um, 7.1.4 in this particular room. So I have four speakers, elevated speakers, and I have seven speakers in the horizontal plane. So I found the last few years, particularly the um, emphasis has moved away from 5.1, which is what I used to do a lot of, to Atmos. Atmos became a big thing, particularly last spring when Apple adopted Atmos. It suddenly became all about Atmos. Everything I got asked to do was, can you do, can you do an Atmos mix? It was almost it went from 5.1 to Atmos overnight. So I get invited to do a lot of these um, fantastic classic albums, you know, um, you know, real textbook canonical albums. And I get asked to do them into, I get asked to remix them into surround. Um, the trick for me, trick is the wrong word, but the approach for me is first of all, to try to match the original stereo as closely as possible. So I get the raw multi-tracks. So here I've got a 16 track tape. The, the track was recorded originally on 16 track. Four channels dedicated to the drums, two channels dedicated to the bass, four channels of guitar, one channel of acoustic, one channel of organ, and a bunch of vocal tracks. So it's quite, you know, uh, and some hand claps in the middle. So it's quite, by modern standards, it's quite economically recorded, quite sparsely recorded. But the trick is being able to create the sonic signature of the original mix. Now of course on the original mix they were going through old Neve consoles, I don't know what they were using, particularly they were using old outboard gear, old plate reverbs and things. And we're very lucky now that we have the modern plug-in emulations of those old vintage outboard units. Amazing. I mean I didn't grow up using those old units so I'm, I'm not snobby about using the old stuff. I just no, when I listen to these old tracks, I can hear, ah, I can recognise the signature now. I've been doing it so long, I ah, that's a, that's a 140, EMT 140 plate, or that's a 1176 compressor. I can hear, I've learned to be able to hear the signature of these units. And we're very lucky now that we have these incredible emulations um, of these old plugins. Um, as well as, you know, emulations of, so there's the EMT 140 plate, for example, which I'm using on the track, as well as emulations of, you know, of um, analog tape. So I usually tend to put an analog tape simulator uh, across the mix, just to give it that little bit of, you know, analog tape saturation, that sort of signature of tape. Um, so we're, you know, lucky. I'm lucky in the sense that I have access to all these tools that enable me to get close to the sound of these original. In this case, a, a track from 1971, and and I've learned to, as I say, I've learned to kind of understand what I'm hearing when I listen to the original mixes. And my process is very much, let's get as close as possible to the sound of the original mix, so that when I'm listening to the stereo, the old stereo and the new stereo, I'm almost at the point where I can't hear the difference between my mix and the old mix. I can, you know what I mean? But if you weren't, if you weren't concentrating, you wouldn't notice a big difference. If you concentrate, yeah, you can hear. It's hopefully a little bit more clarity, actually, a little bit more separation, a little bit more air around the instruments because you're not fighting the old, you know, limitations of analog tape which has its pros and cons, of course, too. But I personally like, you know, like the sound of um, digital, particularly working at very high resolution. And I work at 96K. I work with 96K, sometimes 192K. But I understand there's still some people that will always prefer the signature of, of analog tape and, and all that stuff. But anyway, so I get to the point where I almost can't tell the difference between the original analog mix and my new digital recreation of that mix. And at that point, I, separate, I start to break it out into surround sound. And actually, it's interesting to me, 90% of the work is in getting to that stage. Recreating the reverbs, recreating the EQs, recreating the compressions, the delays, the rides, the stereo placement. Um, 
anything where you can hear that the guitar solo has been pushed in volume for a few bars. And so for me, it's very forensic. It's like listening to every few bars of the original and, ah, okay, they've, I can hear they've pushed that snare drum beat there. And getting all those little details right, because if you don't get those things right, you'll upset the people that know those albums and have been listening to them for, you know, 50 years in this case, you know, they'll know those things. So you want to, you want to pick out all those little details. Ah, the, the vocals been panned over to the left for a moment there, or the backing vocals flip from left. And all of those things I try and mirror in the surround. So if the lead guitar is on the left, then it, I'll have it on the left in the, in the Atmos mix too. If the guitar solo is panned from left to right in the stereo, then I might have it panning, but around the room. So that I'm kind of, taking clues from the original mix about, oh, you know, they were happy to pan it, you know, so let's do something wacky in the surround. So all of those things, I, I kind of take my clues from the original stereo mix. And so 90% of the work really happens before I even get to the breaking it out into surround. And at that point, it really is just having fun with placement. So the reverbs have been recreated, the EQs have been recreated, all the level and ride information has been recreated. Okay, let's place things now. And that's just fun, you know. Put the hand claps in the back or, you know, put the acoustic guitar above you or put the backing vocals, you know, up there or... So I have a lot of fun at that point. Um, so it's been really very, very important to me to have these headphones because these headphones really tell me exactly what's going on in the original mix exactly what's going on in the original mix uh, how much low end is there you know how much have they hyped the top end on the on the lead vocal you know anything like that what's the what's the tail on that reverb and i can hear it all using these headphones so i pretty much work exclusively uh, on the headphones now in terms of recreating the stereo stereo mix um, and that's been my process and it's worked very well for me I think the fans have appreciated the approach because it is almost like the opposite of what I would do with my own music it's almost like allowing myself to disappear into the signature of the people that originally made the music and originally mixed the tracks. I'm not imposing my own ideas. So I'm not saying, you know what, wouldn't it be great if that lead vocal had a big reverb on it? No. If they didn't do that on the original, I'm not going to do it. So it's almost like allowing yourself to be absorbed into the, the, you know, the original decisions that were made 50, 40 years ago. And I think the fans have appreciated that because it's there's a kind of inherent paradox in a way, which is that you're, when you take a classic album, something that's almost canonical, almost like a textbook album, you almost don't want to change. You don't want people to, to have a jarring experience when they hear it. You almost want them to hear it the same way they've always heard it, but at the same time you want them to hear it in a different way. But the latter part is the fact that they're hearing it suddenly around them. You're wrapping the music around them with, with the surround field. But all of the other stuff, the tones, the levels, the reverbs, all of those things, you almost don't want those things to jar with the listener. You want them to sound the way they always did. So there is a kind of, you know, I, I've always likened it to, you know, cleaning up the Sistine Chapel. You don't want to change what Michelangelo painted all those years ago. You just want to make it shine in a slightly different way to make the experience slightly different, but not in a way that jars with people's memories of how they've been hearing it or looking at it for 40, 50 or centuries in the case of the Sistine Chapel. And so it's very fortunate for me that I'm operating now in an era where I think the tools are available to do that. 10, 20 years ago, I don't think the plugins were quite there. I don't think the headphones were quite there. I don't think the even the resolution that people were working at 
you know, 10, 15, to, I, remember, I remember working on mixes in the early days and I was getting files at 48K. Now I get them at 96, 192. And I just think it makes that little bit of difference um, in terms of recreating that organic analog experience, but paradoxically in the digital domain. And I know a lot of people are very purist about that, but I think, you know, they say, well, it's not the same as working on analog tape through analog consoles. I, th I really believe that we're running out of excuses now. The technology is getting so good. The plugins are getting so good. The resolution that we can work at in digital is getting so good that actually those kind of excuses and those complaints it doesn't sound the same as analog. It's getting so close now. And if you know what you're doing with the plugins and you use them, I think, in a, in a, in a creative way or in a way that's faithful, it's so close now. It's so close that I think that, you know, there will always be a little bit of a margin in terms of you can never recreate exactly the sound of a Neve console in, a, in Abbey Road in 1967 or whatever it was they were using. You know, you, you'll never get completely to that point. But we have the tools now to get incredibly incredibly close so that I think most ears would struggle to I can't you know I get to the point where I can barely tell the difference you know